Watch this. It's now the dominant strain of COVID in America, but numbers, or one number, makes us wonder if that's the case in Idaho. You know about the famous Idaho Potato Bowl. I mean, the name tells you you should. It's a Tuesday afternoon in December in Boise football tradition. Maybe you didn't know how big this game is for one familiar face with two unblinking eyes. Just four days until the big man parks his sleigh on rooftops around the world when he's been supposed to slip down the chimney and slip presents under the tree. Well, wait till he sees what versions of himself y'all are hanging on that tree. Well, this COVID has become more fusion than the latest trendy restaurant, mixing Greek and French. Omicron is like deja vu. The latest variant is now the dominant strain of the coronavirus in America. It took over Delta last week. How about the speed record that it used, though? Omicron detected in South Africa in November, found in the United States on December 1st. Now, 73% of new cases across the country are caused by Omicron, according to the CDC. And states hit hardest are responding, like New York. Broadway shows shut down. The ball drop in Times Square in serious danger of being canceled. A decision will be made before Christmas. Meanwhile, in Idaho, just one confirmed case of Omicron. And that confirmation came 11 days ago on December 10th in Ada County. But this variant is supposed to be super contagious, right? Doubling from week to week. Is that happening except in Idaho? Which is why Lisa in Boise sent us this text message yesterday. How can it be that Omicron variant accounts for 73% of cases nationwide, but only one case has been found in Idaho? Not testing enough or just a fluke, she asks. It's a question we've been trying to get answered for the last couple of days. Is it a lack of testing? Is it a delay in those results? Or is it really just not showing up here? We reached out to the Idaho Department of Health and Welfare to ask about sequencing, the test for Omicron, and to see if that lone case is still, well, alone. Like a PCR test, we were waiting to hear back and still haven't yet. But this is what we do know. Earlier this summer, the Idaho Department of Health and Welfare said they plan to ramp up their sequencing efforts. Because before, they only looked at positive tests they believe could have been caused by certain variants. And only those tests were sent to labs that had the ability to do such sequencing. Idaho yet uh, does not yet have that ability. But they changed that to include all positive tests, sending all of those out. The state saying they would figure a way to make it all work out eventually. So what about testing? Testing in the state has steadily declined over the last few months. You can see it on that graph here. Those are the purple bolded lines. A bit more than 26,000 tests performed last week, a 16% decrease from the week before. The positivity rate, though, is also down about 6.5%, which kind of goes hand in hand, you would think. That you could see by the slim blue line there on that graph, and it's the lowest it has been since July. That seems like great news, right? Just one case of Omicron in Idaho in the last 11 days? That's, you, you probably bet the farm that's not the case anymore. In fact, there's a way some of these medical experts know that for sure, without sending these tests out of state to verify variants. We hope to have that explanation coming up for you tomorrow. But if there is a bright spot in all this, while Omicron is reported to be more contagious, we're learning that symptoms are said to be milder for those fully vaccinated. And as for those vaccines and whether the federal government can impose mandates on private companies, it looks like it could be locked up in legal limbo again. Sort of. We'll see. Who knows? President Biden issuing that order back on November 4th saying companies with more than 100 employees would have to require them to get vaccinated against COVID or get weekly tests. It was supposed to happen by January 4th, but it was quickly jumped on by several states in a lawsuit, including Idaho, and a federal judge blocked that on November 30th. Then Friday, the Sixth Circuit Appeals Court reinstated the order, meaning it could go ahead as planned. But then yesterday, Governor Brad Little and the state of Idaho joined 26 other states once again to file an emergency motion asking the Supreme Court to reinstate the stay on OSHA's vaccine mandate. Here's how Governor Little put it. We are doing all we can to put a stop to Biden's unprecedented government overreach into the private sector. The majority of the nation's governors oppose Biden's damaging and ineffective vaccine mandate policies, but he continues to push them on citizens, businesses and states. The new deadline set for January 6th, but the Supreme Court does or has some time to rule on it, and they're supposed to rule on it by the end of this month, so maybe not a whole lot of time. There were two other lawsuits filed on similar grounds, you may remember. One about federal contractors having to be vaccinated. The other requiring Medicare and Medicaid providers to be vaccinated. 
Both of them have been blocked by the courts. All right, we have the state bird, we have a state tree, and a state vegetable. One of only 13 to have one of those things. But none are as cool or as energetic as ours. And today is his Super Bowl. From taters to 208 waiters. Well, I guess we could call them 20 taters, right? Does that make sense? Whatever. We want to hear from all of you wanting to take part in the 208 conversation. Now is the time to text us your questions, your comments, your concerns, and yeah, we can even take the criticism. It helps, though, if they're creative. A little spoonful of sugar kind of thing. Here's our number, 208-321-5614. Be sure to include your name and the hashtag, the 208. We're going to share some of them at the end of the show. I may not be the only midweek bowl game of the season. It's not even the only bowl game going on today, but the famous Idaho Potato Bowl is the northernmost bowl game on the schedule. Played outdoors in 40 degree temperatures on a blue field with the snow covered Boise Mountains as the backdrop, and it is so Idaho in so many ways. I mean, where else does a gay game day begin with a French fry eating contest like this one? Take a look at those kids winning that contest. I'm not sure exactly who won, but all of them did very well. And what the heck? Free fries, right? That's pretty good. Famous Idaho Potato Bowl. While the teams, the Golden Flashes of Kent State and the Cowboys of Wyoming, have worked and earned the honor to play in this game. You know, those watching from seats inside Albertson Stadium, yeah, uh, maybe. Let's take a look at it. Tuesday before Christmas, mid-afternoon. I know it's a little tough. We're speculating on the over-under on the fans and the games in the newsroom, in the stands, I should say. This was a picture that was taken 30 minutes before kickoff today. No one in their seats, at least at this end of the stadium, right? Or on that far end of the stadium. Not crazy. I mean, 30 minutes before, there's still fries being eaten and cooked up. This is the first quarter, though. Game's on. Actually, Wyoming made their first touchdown, and that's what it looked like on the eastern side of the stadium. So not a whole lot of tickets out there. By the way, Wyoming ended up winning that game 52-38 over Kent State. Just wrapped up moments ago. And if you're a longtime follower of the famous Idaho Potato Bowl, you may know the action off the field is just as entertaining as we just kind of showed you. Joe Paris met up at Albertson Stadium with one of the all-time legends in the state of Idaho. Oh, sure, there's a big game on the blue with two teams wearing yellow pants. But do you know who the real star of the famous Idaho Potato Bowl is? Spuddy Buddy. Wait a minute, you don't know? <laughs> if you logged online during the football game, you may have noticed that it was far easier to find Spuddy Buddy content than even the score of the game. So where did the legend of Spuddy begin? In a sack of Idaho potatoes? Spuddy spokesman Sue Kennedy fills us in. It's a great story. Oh, very much so. About 25 years ago, Spuddy Buddy made his debut at the Today Show window in New York City. And Al Roker was immediately drawn to Spuddy Buddy and said, who is this? And um, one of the commissioners at the time said, Spuddy Buddy. And that's when the name was born. And that's when Spuddy Buddy became world famous. She isn't kidding. Spuddy goes coast to coast spreading the good word about Idaho potatoes. Sure, Spuddy's a hometown hero, but on the road, 
it still always feels like home. Oh, crazy. People love Spotty Buddy because they've seen him. They've heard of him. They saw him on the Today Show. They see him on social media. And then um, to, to get to meet Spotty Buddy in real life is a really big deal. And Spotty has a full team to support all the hard work. It's very hard. It's very, very hard. That's why Spuddy Buddy actually has a bodyguard over there um, who has to make sure that people keep their distance. If you've noticed, a lot of the mascots get a little jealous and want to do chest bumps. So um, that's why we have the bodyguard. If you've seen Spuddy, you already know. This tater is full of excitement, and there's a big reason for that. Spuddy Buddy is full of energy. She's a potato and potatoes offer lots of energy. They have a lot of great complex carbs that are very important to you and that's what you get. And sure, there will be cheers today for the action on the blue, but it's fair to say I think Spuddy likely got some of the loudest pops of the day. Spuddy Buddy, <laughs> aww, Spuddy Buddy. Everybody loves Spuddy Buddy and everybody loves Idaho potatoes. It's just a perfect fit. It's natural, and how can you not smile when you see this? You just see Spuddy Buddy and you want to smile. Oh. We go back a long way. And is there anything that makes you smile more than T-Rex <laughs> arms, by the way? It's, yeah, on a, that can on make a tuber. You know. So, big day for Joe. Yeah, ideal. big day for Joe. I told everyone on <laughs> social media, it was my big one-on-one -on -one interview. I got there, it turns out Spuddy doesn't talk, so good thing Sue is there. But you didn't know that going in. I never talked to a potato. Oh, that's true. I run into Spuddy once in a while, but we don't talk. But I just want to highlight that the reason we did that story is if you were on social media, Twitter, Reddit, mm -hmm. Facebook today, there yeah. was more posts about Spuddy Buddy from people outside of Idaho yep. than anything about the game, about Boise, about Idaho. Spuddy Buddy stole center stage. so Always does, every year for this game. So we had to give him his due. Anywhere, anywhere he shows up, exactly. And yeah. Bodyguard, doesn't he have eyes all over his body to kind of... Brian Holmes, everyone. Oh, uh, well. That's okay. Brian Holmes. All right, so stick around, Joe, because this is a story here we want to talk yes. about. This is the time of year we start to get nostalgic about what we've done throughout yeah. the year here on the 2-8 and basically pretty much anywhere. But as we wrap up our final week of the 2-8, because we won't be here next week, however, we will be back in the new year, so don't be too concerned. We want to look back at some of the stories that we have done yeah. through this year that had an impact on us and maybe they had an impact on you as well. Some of our favorites. Today... Joe's turn to take the reins. And obviously, you know, if it wasn't for today, Spuddy Buddy would be on that list. Well, today, that, right? that piece we just showed. Yeah. That's one. That's one. And, and then, then the we'll rest. see the rest. Oh, gotcha. All right. 2021. What a time, right? So many stories, so many developments. But these were some of the stories that stuck out to me when reflecting on the year that was. And I'll start back in January. That's when I told Brian Holmes I was going to get rich selling stocks at home. Spoiler, I did not get rich, but some people did, and the work-from-home stock craze hit an all-time major peak when online investors, including people in Idaho, started pushing less popular stocks like GameStop, Nokia, and AMC Theaters. Long story short, these online users knew that professional hedge managers had to buy up more of their stock so that they would not lose their vested interest. Users on the subreddit page Wall Street Bets took note, and they rushed in mass to invest in things like GameStop. But select stock prices suddenly soared, begging the question, did a group from the internet really drive stock prices up? The world was talking about it, but our friends from the Barker Capital Management and Trading Program at the University of Idaho, well, they helped set us straight. I don't think it's that simple. I believe it started that way, but it's very evident from the trading. What's happening is that the larger money, the uh, uh, trend fund followers, the algorithmic um, funds, that's what's been playing with this now. It's, this is no longer the smaller, what's called retail investors. People saw volatility. They saw that this was a weak market that has potential, I don't want to say manipulated, but potential to, to be moved much more quickly. And uh, to me, that's, that's what I see has happened. What's usually a January through April season became something much more at the Idaho State House this year. The House has adjourned sine die. Lawmakers set the state record for the longest legislative session ever at 311 days. It was quite a journey looking back on it all. Executive powers, COVID restrictions, vaccine mandates, ethics, property taxes, critical race theory, and more powered passionate debates inside the big building in downtown Boise. Now, we could probably fill 24 hours straight breaking down the session that was this year, but we'll pass on that for now. After an unofficial mid-year break, the session came down to the final three days in November. Then lawmakers returned to take on the Biden administration vaccine mandates. In the end, though, lawmakers passed on passing legislation, opting to wait till next year. Everyone knows this on some level. 
Now we get wrapped up in our own ideas and the strength of those ideas according to us, but until uh, we go through a vetting process, until they are peer reviewed, I mean, and we want our system to work that way. If we're gonna change laws, we want there to be a thorough vetting in both the House and the Senate because our system moves slow on purpose. We don't change things easily. And, uh, and when we do, that we do it when there is agreement. And uh, if we don't have agreement, we shouldn't change it. The year 2021 also marked the end of an era for America. Nearly 20 years after we started, the war in Afghanistan was over. In the final days of the war, American troops continued fighting off terror attacks and helped to evacuate thousands of Americans and Afghans. It was a very bittersweet bookend for Idaho veterans who fought in Afghanistan. Boise Army veteran Greg Williams shared his thoughts with us as thousands of people tried to escape Afghanistan as the sudden U.S. exit ensued. It's, uh, I mean, it's been a roller coaster of emotions, honestly. It's mostly anger and sadness, to be honest. Um, you know, obviously for the lives that were lost, um, you know, that was obviously where, where my head went first is, you know, the, the Marines and the soldiers that we lost were absolutely unnecessary. I think that every American service member knows when they enlist um, that they may be asked to give their life if needed. The unfortunate thing was in this case, I just don't think that it was needed. I think that it was poor execution and planning, uh, poor execution and planning that has not had accountability taken for it yet. Um, and just all around, you know, anger at the situation, something that just certainly did not need to happen. And even if it were to happen, it could have, it could have been executed much better. Much like 2020, 2021 was a huge challenge for Idaho's medical community. A strong wave of COVID powered by the Delta variant pushed Idaho into crisis standards of care statewide back in the fall. Healthcare workers did everything they could to save very sick patients dying from COVID, but all of this took a toll on our healthcare heroes, pushing some out of the career altogether. We were reminded of the personal toll the pandemic's taken on hospital staffers when we introduced you to St. Luke's cardiac nurse, Sarah McDonald. Her emotional poem about her experiences helped the community understand better what the medical community continues to go through. On to the next, on to the next, on to the next until morning. We just have to make it till morning. We just have to make it while morning. We just have to make it still morning. We just have to make it on to the next. Obviously COVID weighing heavily on 2021. Mm -hmm. A year ago at this time, vaccine was in Idaho. It's all over the country. And we were thinking yeah. there's the light at the end of the tunnel, but it kind of dragged on. In fact, got worse. Yeah. This year. Well, I mean, the, the worst part of the pandemic that we saw was in 2021, you right. know, as we referenced the entire state went into crisis standards of care back in the fall. And as you know, I was reflecting on 2021. I also remember exactly a year ago. So the end of 2020, you and I had talked and we had talked with our staff. Oh, a year from now, we'll be heading into the holidays and this will be behind us and it'll be a much different time. And as we get to the end of 2021, I don't think that I was right about that. You know, and it's also interesting thinking about where we are now as we head into 2022 next week. And, you know, as we take a look back at some of these news stories, of course, we couldn't include all of my favorite stories. There's some happy ones. There's some sad ones. But you really cannot talk about 2021 without talking about the significance of COVID here in Idaho. Yeah, well, at least we're going into 2022 differently than we went into 2021 because, again, we have a vaccine now yeah. and it is more widespread. Yeah. And we'll see how it goes. Well, all right. Thanks, Joe. Good yeah. look back. Thanks. Your collection of Christmas ornaments seems illogical and a bit creepy if we're being honest, which is how you'd want us to be, right? More of your weird and frankly ugly holiday decorations. You still got some time to send yours in if you haven't already. Text us a picture to the number on your screen, 208-321-5614. Make sure to include your name and a brief explanation as well as the hashtag the 208. That number also works for whatever else you want to share. Remember, we could share your message in another show or at the end of this one.
Now, some of y'all have some really interesting tastes in holiday decorations, and we have the pics to prove it. Continuing our run up to Christmas with the weirdest, ugliest, and yes, even creepiest collection of decorations you have sent us. Let me just preface this by saying we know you love them and they have sentimental value to you. But let's talk about the white elephant in the room. How long is too long to hold on to some of these? There's classic Christmas, and then there's whatever these are. Yo ho ho ho! A Christmas pirate from Vicky. Did someone say scurvy? They should. Then there's the fishing flamingo from Hugh in Twin Falls. Jane Vossen thinks this could be a close to a classic. The Christmas star, fish, cow? Like that, you'll love this wicked lobster claw from Boston. Wicked. Was the night before Christmas when all through the house not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. And you can be sure of that. How about a throwback to last year? Pat Ware's pandemic toilet paper roll? The start of a tradition. More paper, but even less understanding. Robert made this for his grandparents when he was four, back in 1998. Three pieces of paper crinkled and glued together. Makes it on the tree every year, yet they still don't know what it is. He told them to figure it out. Robert is now a tech sergeant in the Air Force, figuring it out. Cindy Wright hates clowns and this ornament, which is why she makes her husband put it up on the back side of the tree so she can't see it. Want to know what we'd like to not see or drop in on? What some people pass along for the jolly old elf himself. Stardate 1975, Bobby Joe Anderson's son Joey. Oh yeah, he boldly went there and made this Vulcan Santa and it's made it on the tree every year since. Joey is now Mr. Anderson at Mountain Home High School, and he still loves Star Trek. Carolyn's grandmother had this ornament from the early 60s. She loves him, but her sister calls him Creepy Santa, and we can see why. Let's keep going with the creepy. Nothing to dread, not so much. Joe Horning has this puffy peddler. However, it terrified his son, and he had to put him away. James and Heidi got this idea of Kris Kringle from Cabo San Lucas just last week. Why? Chuck Shear's Santa has been around since the early 20th century. Wow, a hand-me-down that maybe should have been handed off. And finally, Sherry sent this along. A father Christmas made from an apple by her father when he was in junior high. He's 87 now and likely looks less aged than this apple. To all a good night, good luck.
Our final moments of the show to share some of your messages like this question from Susie who asks, what is the original name of COVID? I see all these variants, but what's the OG name? Remember the name SARS-CoV-2? Remember that? Yeah, that was the original name given to it after it was kind of discovered and became a little bit more prevalent. So it's a coronavirus with the name SARS-CoV-2, not CoV-1, which is already out there. Does Governor Little realize if he's successful, more Idahoans will die than would have to? Rich from Meridian asks, based on this lawsuit, to stop the federal government from mandating that companies with more than 100 employees require them to get vaccinated or tested. The governor does not represent me. We've lost and are still losing my fellow Idahoans to COVID. One is too many and you're suing. Wake up, man, says John. We'll see you tomorrow.